Hi guys, my name is Guilherme and welcome to the second exercise of cd 3 dst which is going to be about graph neural networks and tracking. Um, as usual, please, uh, if you have any questions, just come to office hours. They will be announced um, and also post your questions on Moodle. And if you're willing to, you can also send us an email. So there will be two main tasks in this exercise. The first one is about uh, improving the VAD-based tracker from the previous exercise. The second one will be uh, about building a, a GNN-based tracker from scratch. Um, let's look at first the, the, the first part of the exercise. So uh, as a quick recap, uh, in the previous exercise, we developed this Hungarian frame-by-frame -frame tracker. So basically, at every uh, iteration, at every new frame, it considered uh, detections and then it also considered uh, tracks in the past frame and it built this pairwise uh, cost matrix encoding the real similarity between every pair of new detections and, and past tracks and then performed bipartite matching based on, on this matrix in order to link the current object detections to past frames or just initialize new tracks for those objects that were not present in the past frame. So uh, a clear limitation of this approach is that whenever our detector misses an object due to occlusion, and this is very, very common in, in practice, um, our, track will not, our tr tracker will not be able to recover the trajectory. Because essentially when, when doing the dissociation, uh, the, that box, that track in the previous frame will not be present, and therefore uh, we will just initialize uh, a new track with the detection that will remain unmatched. So uh, an obvious way to fix this issue is just by considering not only uh, tracks in the previous frame, but also in, in other past frames when doing bipartite matching. And this will allow us to not necessarily kill these tracks, but keep them alive for a few frames and still be able to match them to new detections, uh, even if, if the track has not uh, been detected in, a, in, a, in some frames. Okay, so this is what you will have to implement uh, in the first part of the exercise. Now let's look at the second part of the exercise. And, and this will be maybe the, the more challenging one, but please do not feel intimidated. We have tried very hard to, to make this uh, relatively clear. And as I said before, please just come to office hours if you uh, are having difficulties with it. So this part of the exercise is going to be based on this paper from our group, co-authored by myself and, and Professor Laura Leal Teixeira. And we recommend you to quickly go through the paper to better understand this part of the exercise. Uh, or maybe just watch the video, it's on YouTube, it's five minutes long, and I, I think it will probably help you uh, have a better understanding of, of this part of the exercise. Um, in any case, the, what we will do here is not simply implementing the paper, but we will be borrowing some, some ideas from it, but we will still be sticking to the same setting that we had before. So in the paper, we worked on an offline setting. This means we had access to both past frames as well as uh, future frames. Well, here we're still on the same setting as the first part of the exercise. So we have uh, a given frame with new object detections and we need to match those to only past trajectories. So, the, the main idea is that we still, just as before, we, we do this via Hungarian matching by considering some similar discourse between past tracks and current de de detections. But instead of uh, using re-ID similar discourse uh, in between the two sets, we will be using some, uh, uh, some predictions made by a graph neural network. So more specifically, uh, we will have um, this graph, which will consist of, of, of nodes, and nodes will have read embeddings as features, as well as edges, and these edges will contain uh, relative distance and relative position uh, information uh, in them. And, and basically each edge will have an embedding, and via uh, applying neural message passing, we will update these edges, so that in the end, we will just classify edges to obtain our final scores. So, the main idea is that instead of com uh, considering just pairwise similarities between nodes, we will explicitly model pairs of nodes uh, with edges 
and we will learn some edge embeddings via neural message passing to finally classify those edges and obtain our final similarity scores. So the, the maybe harder part to understand here is how this neural message passing part uh, will work. So make sure, uh, in order to understand this, that you go through lecture 5. So there are some slides there that explain uh, how neural message passing works in general. And we will stick to the formulation presented there. And just as a quick recap, uh, we have uh, our graph with node and edge features. And our goal is to uh, propagate those features across the graph and obtain new node and edge features. In our case, we will only care about edge features because this is the thing that we will classify in the end. So this propagation step um, works in a series of iterations. And at every iteration, there are two updates. First, we update edges, then we update nodes. Edge updates are relatively straightforward. We given an edge, we just concatenate it with its incident nodes features, apply an MLP, and then obtain new features. For nodes, uh, it's not that much harder. We simply take every node in the graph, we consider its neighboring nodes, and we take those incident edges from the neighboring nodes and aggregate them, uh, concatenate them with the current nodes uh, features and apply an MLP to the result to obtain a newly updated nodes that now encode uh, neighbor's information. So in general, if you want to work with graphs, uh, it, it makes sense to simply use one uh, specialized library uh, to do this. But in our case, uh, just to maybe have a better understanding of how these things work internally, uh, we will uh, be implementing this in pure PyTorch code uh, from scratch. And this, in general, would be a bit hard uh, due to the difficulty of working with uh, graph data structures. But since our graphs will have a specific structure that will be bipartite, uh, our task will be significantly simpler than in the general case. So our graphs are bipartite, but this means is that um, we know in advance that we have uh, two sets of uh, nodes. They do not overlap, and we only have connections in between those two sets. So in our case, we have past tracks, we have uh, object detections, and we only consider connections among them because these are the connections that we can create uh, um, in data associations. We do not have connections, for instance, in between detections, nor connections in between past tracks. So maybe now let's look at how we will use data structures to, to store this information and then to, to uh, implement neural message passing. So as I said before, we have one node embedding per, uh, per every node, that is one, one feature vector with dimensionality node dim. And basically, we, we store this node embedding by, by concatenating, uh, stacking as rows, the node uh, embedding corresponding to every node. So as a result, we end up with a matrix with as many rows as, as number of nodes we have in A, and as many columns as dimensions we have in each embedding. We do the same thing for B, and we end up with another matrix, and this time with cardinality of B, rows, and the same number of columns. Um, now, as I said before, we also have edge embeddings, and to, to store them, we use the fact that we have uh, as many edges as pairs of uh, nodes in A and B. So this is cardinality of A times cardinality of B. So the idea is that we have to store one edge embedding for every pair. So this is straightforward. We just have, um, so for every location here, so for every node in, in A, we have uh, its corresponding location uh, in B, another location in B, and then we consider the edge features of that location here. So in total, we have three dimensions because we can have any possible node in B, any possible no node in B, and then we have the feature dimension. Let's maybe look at some examples. So if we are looking at this uh, edge feature right here, we'll be looking at the first row in A, uh, the first, uh, sorry, node in A, the first node in B, and therefore we'll be here at the first row and first column. If we move one step uh, right, we're just looking at then the second node in B, and therefore uh, this edge, which would correspond to this location, um, and so forth. So what's important for you to grasp, grasp here is that in order to access the neighbors of one node in A, we only need to look at, at its corresponding row uh, in this tensor. And in analogy, when we have a node in B and we want to look at its neighbors in A, we need to look at its column. Why is this important? 
Um, the trickier part of implementing the graph neural network is uh, having these operations that require you to uh, aggregate feature vectors over the neighborhood of a node. But if you think about the way we are storing edge embeddings here, this is quite straightforward because aggregating over neighborhoods just translates into uh, summing over uh, rows. If we are talking about nodes in sorry, column, columns, if we are talking about nodes in A, or rows, if we are talking about nodes in, uh, in B. Therefore, this uh, should probably make it relatively simple for you to uh, understand how to implement uh, the node updates. Um, if not, um, well, please try to, to spend some time thinking about this. And if this is still not clear, as I said before, uh, please just come to office hours and we'll try to work on that. Okay, lastly, I'm gonna uh, quickly walk you through the notebook. So as usual, you have to do a bit of, a, of setup. So you simply have to, uh, I mean, yeah. First, we are assuming that you already did the setup for exercise zero, because we need the data set from there. Then you have to download this uh, zip file. You have the link here. Uh, so download it, uh, unzip it uh, in, your, in your local machine, and then upload it uncompressed to Colab notebooks. Once you've done this, uh, we move on to the exercise. So, um, yeah, the first thing to note here is that everything, hopefully, in this notebook should be running much faster than in the previous one. Uh, since essentially there's many, a lot of computation that is done several times, such as detecting every box and every sequence and computing VAD embeddings, uh, we decided to do all this computation for you, store it on a file, and then adapt all the code so that it it never really uh, applies a detector, for instance, but only loads detection directly. So this uh, allows uh, testing and training to be much faster in this notebook. So, okay, moving on. Uh, the first thing that you need to do uh, is look at this baseline that we are providing you. So this is just a sample solution from the previous exercise that we're giving you as a, as a reference. Um, as a sanity check, you can make sure that you're getting these uh, same results. You just have to run this and make sure that you that your results match the ones we have here. Now, we build upon this uh, solution uh, in your first uh, real task, which is to extend this tracker into the long-term reality tracker, as I described a while ago. So here we, we tell you explicitly uh, the part of the code that, that you need to change. This is related to uh, keeping track of, of, of inactive tracks. Um, and this will be like this to the whole notebook. The part that you need to change is always in between these two the blocks. So do not uh, try to modify anything else. Um, and yeah, and we give you a couple of hints here. So this should be relatively straightforward. And here we are giving you uh, the results we get after making this modification. So make sure move up before moving on that you can also get something similar to these scores. Um, this is very important because the, the MPN tracker uh, will be based uh, upon this class. So if, if you cannot match this performance, then your uh, message passing uh, tracker will also suffer. So make sure that you get this right before moving on. Um, and now we move on to the main part of the exercise, which is this uh, tracker based on neural message passing. Uh, so if you're, we give you here some notation. This is similar to what I explained in, in, in the slides, but maybe a, a bit more formal. So we split um, the, the model into two classes. The first one is a bit abstract, uh, as in the slide. It's about uh, building a message passing network on an arbitrary bipartite graph. And then we have uh, another class that we'll go into it later that uses this class. Uh, to produce the, the entire set of costs from, from the tracking features. But first, uh, let's look at, at this bipartite um, neural message passing layer. So what this does is that this uh, performs a, a message passing update. And I explained before, um, this is split into two steps. First, you update edges, then you update nodes, and this is one iteration. We will do several of these. Um, and here, yeah, the forward is already implemented. You just have to uh, implement the, the core part, which is exactly what the uh, what the edge update does and the, what the node update does. Um, so here, things to keep in mind. The exact formulas uh, are given in slides. Here, we even specify which slide the formula is in. 
So please stick to that. Um, yeah. Also, please keep in mind what I explained in my slides uh, about uh, about the tensors that we're working with, because if you follow this, this should be quite simple. Ideally, an efficient implementation of this shouldn't be longer than four to five lines. Uh, and the same thing applies here to the node update. So if you keep in mind uh, the way these data structures are used, this should be simple. If, if you, yeah, so in principle, there shouldn't be any for loops here, ideally. So yeah, just maybe try to spend some time thinking about this before trying to implement it. Um, and again, if you have issues here, just come to office hours. Okay, moving on. The idea is that now we use this class uh, as uh, as a layer uh, that, to do message passing, but first we need to uh, get some edge and node embeddings, and this is what this function does, what, what this class does, sorry. So if we look at the forward pass, we basically get uh, re-AD embeddings, current appearance and track appearance, and re-AD embeddings for tracks and, and current frame, and also bounding box coordinates for tracks and the current frame, and timestamps for tracks and current frame. The idea is that we first use this information to get the edge features. This is the part that you will have to implement, do, uh, computing the, the pairwise positional features based on this, uh, in this method. So we have here the to-do, you just have to fill this method. Um, and to and basically the idea is that once you have these edge embeddings, the rest is already done. So we also apply a, a linear layer on top of uh, read the embeddings to reduce the dimensionality. Then uh, we apply the graph net, uh, so that the message passing layer for several iterations. And at each iteration, we, we classify the resulting embeddings. So again, nothing to do here. This is already done for you. You just have to focus on the edge feature computation part. And we are giving you as a reference the formulas from, from our paper. So these are some simple hand engineered features uh, to encode the relative position of two bounding boxes and the relative size and the time difference. So we recommend you to stick to them because we know they work well. But you can also feel free to add other features such as IOU or, or things like this. Okay, lastly, the last part that you have to uh, write code for is uh, using this message passing network to predict the final costs within our tracker. So here we are inheriting from uh, the long-term VAD invariant tracker. And the only part that needs to change is that now, instead of computing the uh, costs or the, the similarities via pairwise distance between read embeddings, we are having a forward pass through the uh, assignment network. So uh, yeah, this is very simple. This actually could be just a one-liner, just having a forward pass. So do not overthink this. Um, yeah, and, and basically uh, just think about how you need to do a forward pass through this network here. Uh, lastly, um, the last part is running this tracker, um, so yeah, training it and, and evaluating it. So we have, we are using uh, five out of the seven sequences in mod 17, in mod 16 for training and two we are leading to for validation. Um, and here we are giving you everything, all the boilerplate code is given, so we have this class to uh, train the, the, the graph network. What internally did this does is it samples randomly a frame from our train set, then it samples uh, past frames to simulate past trajectories, and then it creates a graph out of those and, and trains uh, the classifier. Um, so again, we recommend you to look at those uh, to have a better understanding of, of what's happening here, but um, you don't need to really code anything else here, so everything is given to you. And then we're also giving you the boilerplate training code, you just have to run this here. And this will train uh, and evaluate um, uh, after every epoch. So here we are giving you the reference values that we got with the uh, long-term VAD tracker. And ideally, you should get your MPN tracker to uh, outperform this. So something to keep in mind here is that we observed quite a bit of noise in our scores. So both uh, different runs give you give different results. And different epochs uh, can give you quite some uh, quite some noise in the idea of what values you're getting. However, um, we consistently were able to uh, outperform these uh, values by at least uh, half a percentage point. So, 
Uh, also, yeah, something that, I mean, the, the, this noise is, is basically explained due to, due to the fact that the, we only have five sequences, which is quite small. Um, and yeah, and also the validation set is relatively small, so small changes in predictions can yield uh, large changes in IDF1. However, here, yeah, we, we already observe um, that after a couple of epochs, we are able to outperform um, this baseline by approximately a couple of IDF1 points. But then, for instance, we, we see how scores quickly decrease. We consistently are above uh, 55, but then some epochs can be noisy. They can even fall below the baseline. So just keep this in mind. Uh, don't be scared if one of your epochs is a bit noisy. Um, and maybe just do early stopping. So as, as long as you have uh, good results, kill the training, and, and uh, you can already make a tested submission with that. So also for the tested submission, we are giving you uh, everything here. Uh, just run this cell, and, and this will execute the, the, the test set. Uh, this will output your test set results. Okay, uh, this was everything. Um, again, please just come to office hours or uh, have a post on Moodle if you have questions. Uh, and yeah, uh, wish you good luck with this exercise.